Actually, I didn't know I was going to do a talk on operational impact until I read it, uh, this, the title of it last night. Fortunately, <laughs> <laughs> fortunately, I've also seen Zoe's talk, and, and it really does a good de job on the operational impact. Um, I, I, did, I did wonder what I would say um, about the, comms, the draft comms data bill, because at the last links, Malcolm did a really good overview of the issues for our industry. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is, because of course ha the time for most of the submissions is over, we would have a look at um, basically what people have been saying and what people have been telling the uh, Joint Select Committee. And then Zoe uh, will talk about the operational impact. But I've, the, the actual report, the written submissions, amounted to nearly 450 pages. Right? And some people had clearly put weeks of effort into this. Um, there were, you know, something, something like knocking on 100 um, <coughs> entries. So in the time that we've got, we ain't going to get the proper distillation of uh, 448 so what are pages. So what I've done is I've picked out some choice ones, uh, and I hope I've given, I'm given a reasonable, reasonably fair overview here, because uh, some of the companies were putting two two lots of views together to try and provide a balanced input to the government, and I may only have selected one of them here. So. Um, I've been a number of different uh, oral hearings. Uh, I'll just r rattle through them quickly just to show you that the Home Office has tried to um, present the Joint Select Committee with a balance uh, of different viewpoints. And so here we have uh, the Office of Counter Security Terrorism, uh, the Home Office. Th these are all clearly pro the bill. And some of the comments uh, and responses to the consultation that they put in writing were you know, very much pro. Then we have uh, a session of against. David Davis MP has been quite high profile in uh, coming out against it. As a, you know, some of these are very well known organisations that um, stand up for the rights. Really, um, again, some more pro. Interesting. I actually uh, I was invited by the Home Office to go and visit the Metropolitan Police because I had been quite vociferous in opposing the bill, and. Uh, I spent an afternoon with them, and I really do sympathise with what they're uh, trying to achieve. Uh, of course, the, the wider implications aren't really uh, their concern. And at the end of the day, what it, what it really brought home to me was that, A, we need to do a proper job of educating the politicians um, at this stage of the game. Um, and it is a real concern that we have got politicians involved, because I, I sent a copy of my own submission to, it's the first one I've ever uh, pre provided written evidence to, um, because I've usually left it to links or to ISPA, um, but in this occasion I thought it was too important not to have a say. And I sent it to my MP, who's a Tory, and he came back and said, I, uh, I take note of your comments, but I think that the uh, police should have this kind of information. And so we have an issue that, you know, if that, that's a layman's uh, view of it, it's a very simplistic uh, way of coming up with a solution, with a, with a view, but uh, we have to be very careful that we try and get the message across. So, again, uh, <coughs> some more uh, pro the build, and I, I've got some interesting uh, stances as we go through the talk here as well. Uh, this is anti, so I'm just really giving you a, a feel for the, some of the organisations involved. Uh, some experts, more experts. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the oral presentations go on. I, I am presenting at the House of Lords on, at the end of this month. And, and I think Zoe can probably tell us what the timetable is for completing the review. But interesting, we even have Jimmy Wales here doing a chat. And now, so uh, like I said, 447 pages, almost 100 submissions. Of the submissions, the vast majority were out and out against the bill. Uh, and then there were a number of sort of supportive but expressing concerns. Um, and there were 10 out and out for the bill, um, some of the organizations that we've already seen. And you can understand how the, uh, the Home Office are clearly going to present for the bill. And there were one or two non-committal and unconvinced. And the, as a general um, stance, all of the big ISPs, your, your BT and TalkDog, had their submissions in secret, but most of the big guys have presented supportive noises, but um, but we worried about this. And having spent some time on the ISPA Council, I can see that's really how they play it. They they may want, not want something to happen, 
but they can't be seen to be even too awkward by government. There's a lot of vested interest here. So they pretend that they're, or they, they, they seem to be cooperating, but present enough arguments and hurdles that hope that it'll um, stop it from going forward. So, um, comment, uh, these are comments lifted out of the, uh, the written submissions. So here we can see, you know, the, the tax people, uh, the, the comms data bill is a critical investigative and evidential tool. So they're after your money, serious organized crime. The, uh, you know, these are all, they're obvious comments. And, and in fact, you could look, you could bundle all the people for the bill as really providing the same kind of comment and say, yes, we want it for, these, for all these very good reasons. There's an interesting one from the Financial Services Authority in that they, uh, they obviously welcome it because they, they try to counter fraud. But there's an interesting counter to that a little bit later on, which I'll wait till I get to before telling you. Uh, there's also another interesting uh, input from the uh, some puts of Paul Kennedy, who's the Information Oversight Commissioner. And um, he believed that the current regime set up to run the Ripper scheme works very well. But there's some interesting counters to that, later, which we'll go into later on in the talk as well. Um, local government, which has uh, been excluded from the scope of this bill, is complaining that they actually want to be con included. So they, whereas a local government can uh, apply for RIPA requests now, under the new bill, they're saying they won't be able to, but they're saying, hang on, we, we want to be a part of it as well. And of course, this is already part of the scope creep coming into it before it's even started. And the uh, NAFN is an organization, again, that, um, I'm not exactly sure where NAFN stands for, but they were supportive of the local government stance. Um, of the mainstream players, uh, Telefonica UK02, basically, they, they were generally supportive, if you read all the, the spiel, but they are concerned that, um, by why it, that the, the bill doesn't cover everybody. And so they're concerned that by not covering overseas players, it will be very difficult uh, to provide a, a level playing field. Um, and they're also worried that the, the, the system isn't very robust. The plans are not very well defined. Um, there's a bit of a theme here, because that's basically what Virgin was saying as well. Virgin are concerned that um, third parties who they partner with at the moment, such as TiVo, may decide that they don't really want to play so much in the UK. Um, it's more hassle than it's worth. And they're concerned that that would put Virgin at a disadvantage. So, so Virgin and um, O2, though, are playing uh, economic card, really. There are other, other people who are either supportive or, or, or concerned. But Law Society, uh, pretty, uh, I think these guys would know the, the legals. They're saying that the evidence base for, by which the whole draft bill has been put together is not very strong. Um, and that was a bit of a theme in a, a lot, some of the learned uh, inputs as well. Interestingly, the Direct Mail Association was supportive of the bill but they were annoyed that it uh, covered the postal service, okay, which I hadn't realized till I read the, the submission. I, it's very interesting, 448 pages, if you, you want to read it, because it, it does come out. I've, I've never read the whole thing of a, a written evidence back to front as I did to the, with this one. Um, uh, ISPA, who, you know, uh, I'm on the board of ISPA, but to be honest, ISPA uh, have to play a political game as well, and that they have to be careful not to be seen to be out and out uh, rampantly opposed to things, but they have to try and negotiate their way through some of these scenarios. And so ISPA have uh, raised issues like, you know, questioning the, the way the costs uh, are calculated, uh, and also saying that it's, they believe it's an extension of the scope, which is, of course, uh, the Home Office is saying it's not really an extension, it's just more of the same. Uh, ADM Shine are a, a contractor in the defence industry, I believe, and they were supportive but wanted it only restricted to government agencies. And I, I don't know who the Global Network Initiative are, but they, were in, they wanted to take the opportunity to create a, a world standard for this kind of thing, right? They didn't think it was a, what was being proposed was right, but they felt it was a general idea was good and that the UK should lead the way. And so I'll leave that to your own uh, thoughts as to what you think about that. Um, the Chartered Institute of IT I think we're sort of saying good noises about the bill, but 
were concerned that there were inconsistencies. So basically, the, the draft was saying, uh, one, on one hand, saying one thing, but countering itself in the other. So uh, I pick one out here. What's it? On the one hand, it's saying they have access to all the communications data they need, and on the other hand, it's saying they don't. So it's a little bit, it was a little bit of a strange submission, I thought, from the Chartered Institute of IT, but you have to read it yourself to go into more. Twitter, I thought, came out with some very good points. Twitter um, already deal a lot with government agencies. They provide, in fact, most most information that you want of Twitter, you can search for yourself, okay? Although they do, under duress from the, or under a court order in the States, provide more of the personal information that isn't necessarily um, shown on, a, on your profile publicly. Um, so the, few, the four points I picked out from them were that, in the first instance, in the US, the government is trying to make people provide less and less information uh, publicly and make it available. So here we are in the UK trying to people to collect more information, which goes against what's happening in the States. They also wanted to be able to inform users when, when requests were made about them. That's part of a, a transparent way of working. And of course, uh, classically, that doesn't happen in the, in the whole Ripper type scenario. Um, one of the interesting uh, points as well is that if, if the UK made the people that provided services in this country adhere to this uh, system, with that it would weaken the case for refusing uh, applications for the same information to foreign governments. So you could envisage uh, someone like Syria saying, well, hold on a minute, you're already doing it for the UK government, why don't you do it for us? Okay. And I thought that was very uh, useful input from them. <laughs> Um, and, and the other thing is that, of course, even if Twitter refused to participate and to give the UK government uh, information that they required, because they didn't have to, um, then they may try and do it, uh, gather the information using the, the, gen the filtering of the general networks in the UK uh, and not tell Twitter. And so they're concerned that that would put them in breach of T's and C's and laws that they have back home, and that their, their users' information was being dealt with without Twitter telling them. Okay. So th th I thought they were pretty good points to put across there. Vodafone, uh, also very supportive, or, uh, and again, put inverted commas here, but they were making supportive noises. Um, but they, they raised a lot of points uh, for discussion, which really, you know, several pages you've got to go into. But they, they they're homed in on most of the areas that would you think of naturally homing in on. And I'm not going to need to go into any of the specific detail here. Against the bill, uh, I've just, there were 60 odd uh, people out and out against it, remember. I've just picked out the, the names of organizations. A lot of individuals applied, uh, wrote. And again, these are some of the, the organizations you'd expect. Janet, though, perhaps uh, you may not have expected. I've got some quotes that come along with some of these as well. Um, more, more people who are against it. A few of the objectives, some lovely views there, you know. Most people put very well uh, thought through rational comments. I mean, <laughs> it really is. I, I'm sorry, I haven't got a, I wanted to have a build on this one, but I didn't have the time. Uh, six people die every year falling out of trees. There's no expectation that, expectation that crash mats will be placed under all trees in the UK, just in case. Yeah? about as robust as a chocolate teapot. Verily, how mighty is the Secretary of State. Uh, and the, the proposed bill represents the venal, selfish, sleazy state of the government who proposed it. I thought there were one or two more like that. This is a great one. And I, before I show you this next one, it's, I am only reporting verbatim what's in the, the submission, OK? Has the Home Office made it clear what it hopes to achieve through the draft, draft bill? No, the excuse fighting terrorists is rubbish. There's something that tends to identify terrorists. They're Muslims. The entire population of the UK is not Muslim yet. Ergo, the correct decision would be to only monitoring Muslims. Right? I mean, that's outrageous, obviously. But uh, anyway, I wonder what they've... Uh, they, they probably just made note of that. Um, so, Rend so, Paul Bernal is, is a lecturer at... Uh, 
East Anglia, I think, and uh, he's an, ex an expert in the sort of the general field that we're talking about here. One of the uh, points he made uh, was that having effectively, you know, if you if you let your minds run away with what you'd have to do with implementing the, the bill, uh, you'd have to have man in the middle, all kinds of means of in cracking encryption, and it would, of course, it renders the whole internet banking, e-commerce, and the ability to have VPNs as untrustworthy. If you, have, if you can't be sure that nobody is watching, then how can you be sure that it's actually not the government that's watching, but somebody else has hacked in, right? So if the system is there, that's... And that's, interestingly, in opposition to the um, Financial Services Authority, who you would think would um, have thought about that. Also, the, the European Data Protection Supervisor was talking about the, the, the Data Retention Directive, and he, which, of course, you could say is analogous to this here. And he was saying it's the most invasive, privacy-invasive instrument um, ever adopted. And I, I only slipped the carrier pigeon thing in because of the uh, very famous carrier pigeon race that we did a couple of years ago. Um, let's see. Let me see how much time I've got because I want to leave some for Zoe. Um... The, one of the things that was quite interesting was the stance taken about Ripper. A lot of people considered that Ripper was not a very uh, well thought through um, piece of legislation and had lots of holes in it. And one of the points that Big Brother Watch came out with was a comparison of two police um, forces. In uh, two years, Kent made 7,500 requests for data, and 3, 000, half of them were uh, rejected internally. Okay? But in Mer the same period, Merseyside made 30,000 requests, and only 500 were rejected. So the, there is a, there's an issue there in sort of, A, inconsistency of how the laws and the rules are applied, and it really is at, at odds with what Sir Paul Bernal, who was supposed to look after this, is saying, who he thinks that the whole system is working very well. Okay. Uh, and uh, interestingly also, and I know I keep saying the word interesting, but it is a very interesting read, the whole document. Um, but only 10 people have been found to be wrongly surveyed by uh, Sir Paul Bernard's wa watchdog. And five of those people were in the same family. So they, they, you know, to, to believe that out of 3 million um, applications, that only 10 people were wrongly done, uh, it me basically means that they're not catching them. They're not doing a proper job at uh, if investigating. Um, and also, Big Brother Watch was saying that they support the the need for people to do things through a warrant. But again, Sir Paul Berman was saying that it's not practical to have a warrant system for this because of the volume of um, submissions, which you know you can understand where he's coming from. Uh, just, uh, um, Codec, uh, who are uh, support startups uh, in the UK, uh, they were concerned that the, the costs associated with implementing this, if applied to small businesses, would uh, would be uh, would stop people setting up businesses. Human Rights Commission uh, didn't think there was a, the, the case had been made in the, the draft. And Janet, I mentioned before, were concerned that were, had, Janet had a number of concerns, but one of the specific ones was that in creating new ways of accessing data, it would lead to uh, new ways for crooks to or people to author access this uh, data in an unauthorized manner. Uh, I think we're getting to the end of my bit, but uh, interesting, uh, sorry, correct, if I say interesting again, right, I'm going to put a pound in the swear box. Right? I have to, have to be careful. Uh, the same guy, Sir Paul Kennedy, uh, in support of the fact that we're only looking at communications data here rather than content, is saying it's far less intrusive to just look at the data. But the submission from the Tor project said that actually, because communications data is more designed to be machine readable, you can actually glean a lot more about a person by looking at the communications data than the content, which is not designed to be machine readable. So that was a very strong uh, uh, argument from what is a pretty respectable organization. And uh, the Tor uh, uh, project also said that um, pursuing this line of uh, legislation in the UK would really put people off um, developing in the UK. Um, now, on my way here yesterday, I chatting to the taxi driver, I told some of you boys last night, 
about how many, I asked him how many laptops he'd had left in the back of the car uh, over the last few years. And he said in the last five years, he had eight laptops left in the back of the car. And the taxi driver I spoke to last week said he'd had four laptops in seven years. So on that basis, I re and remembering there's about 25,000 taxis in London, uh, that's roughly one a year per taxi. Okay. So on that basis, there's 25,000 laptops a year left in the back of cabs in London. How many are government? Well, good question, right? <laughs> you can work that out, right? Uh, I have had the, the model has been blown a bit because of the two taxis that we took last night. Neither of them had anything left, but it still gives us half a laptop a year, okay? Based on the sample that we've chosen. Okay? But these are the, the numbers that um, Privacy International has submitted to the um, um, inquiry. And, you know, MOD have lost 658 laptops, 89 lost, uh, st uh, st 658 laptops stolen, 89 lost, and only 32 recovered. You know, I mean, you can read it for yourself. So there's an awful lot of stuff being lost and stolen out there, which really... Yeah. <laughs> See where we're going. Uh, lessons learned from other countries as well. Uh, that the basically, this technology that has been used, which, of course, the, the vendors of the technology are pushing big time, and they've already been pushing it to other countries. And since the Arab Spring, they, they've, and the, the companies have democratized, they found that a lot of this technology has been used to um, track dissidents in, their, in those countries. And the BBC reporter that was uh, murdered in Syria, they believe that that was a result of similar. I can't remember her name now. Uh, she's, yeah, that's right. She's a well-known. Um, and this is my last slide, Zoe. Uh, Wiki, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, the guy that runs Wikimedia, whose name I've completely forgotten, totally uninterestingly, okay, um, they came out against it as well. And uh, they, they likened, you know, if they, that they said that if the UK implemented this, it would liken them to China, Iran, and Kazakhstan, and other uh, countries like that. So that's my little bit of a flavor, OK? Um, now we're going to talk about the operational issues, which Zoe wants to come up. We can have a chat about questions later. Right, what I think about this laptop, I will point out, I am in the Army Reserve. We're not stupid. We do actually encrypt our laptop. It's not as bad as it sounds. Someone, then I'll play this thing. I'm not first line support. How do I get out of this? Ah, escape, that's too obvious. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just give it Okay, for those of you who've seen me with, with a Mac today, I'll point out I only bought a Mac yesterday, so this thing's a little bit weird for me. Right, um, for those of you who don't know, as well as working for an ISP, I am um, a Lib Dem, um, unfortunately, in this, in this day and age. Uh, so I have been fairly heavily involved in a lot of the discussions over the Communications Data Bill. I've, I've followed it uh, in quite some details. Um, for, for many of you lot who are far more more technical than I, because I'm fairly technical, but a lot of you are far more clued up on this than I am. Uh, I'm probably quite clued up about the political side. The politicians think the opposite. They think I'm clued up about the technical side. So I'm kind of sitting in the middle. Um, here's what I'm going to cover. For those of you who are involved, some of this might be a little Mickey Mouse. Um, where we are now, I particularly wanted to cover um, exactly the problem um, that they're trying to solve um, and where we think um, the impact is going to be. One thing I will say is that it was quite hard to write this because, firstly, the Home Office have not been particularly forthcoming with what they want to do. We are basically talking about a bunch of people whose previous careers involved the intelligence services. They are not used to saying things publicly, so they're being very vague when they're talking to us. So when we're talking about operational impact, we're basically going, well, we think you mean that. And they just go, hmm, that's interesting. 
They won't confirm or deny anything. It really is, I cannot confirm or deny anything. Uh, so what happens might be completely different from, from what we think is going to happen. Um, or it might not. It might be exactly the same. We, we don't know whether we're um, aiming in the same ballpark they are. Um, the other difficulty I had writing this was, as I'll cover at the end, this isn't happening. It, it's a draft bill. Um, we kind of brought it into the light to kill it. That is, in fact, probably what's going to happen. It won't go through in the current form. Um, it will be uh, gutted, to use the phrase I heard at a conference recently. Um, if something with the same name comes through Parliament, it won't be the same bill. Um, so some of this may apply, some of it won't. Um, however, it's useful information anyway. Um, to use a quote from a certain um, science fiction series, I can't get up here without using at least one science fiction quote, um, all this has happened before and all this will happen again. Um, they tried this in the last Parliament. They are probably going to have another go in the next Parliament. Um, the security services want something. Even if they don't get this something, they're going to, going to have another go at getting a smaller something. Right, first of all, the current situation. The reason I put this slide in here is to clear up any ambiguity about where we are now. I have seen people get this horrendously wrong. Um, police come knocking on their door. It, it, uh, PC plops them down the road. He wants some comms data. Um, he, he picks up a, a small ISP and says, can I have some comms data? And they go, yes, here you are. Here's a printout of all this person's emails from the last year. Um, don't do this for many reasons. Um, one is it's stupid. Um, two is it doesn't actually help the police because they can't use it because they obtained it unlawfully. Um, so if you're not following these procedures and if you don't know what most of this is, um, please go and talk to someone who does. Otherwise, you might make a mistake that doesn't help the police and doesn't help hack criminals and basically breaches privacy. Um, there's three strands, really, to, to this. I broke it down to three strands to make it easy to, uh, to understand because there's, there's lots of different myths to this. And I've broken it down to interception, storage, and disclosure. Um, roughly at the moment, um, we have interception in the form of a Section 5 warrant. Um, I would ask people to put their hands up if they've ever seen a Section 5 warrant, but if you did, MI5 would quickly come in through that door at the back and take you away, because they are secret. You're not supposed to talk about them. Um, so a number of these do exist, um, but we don't know how many. They are very rarely used. The Secretary of State has to get involved at this level. Um, so when we're talking about Abu and people like that who end up getting booted out of the country, Section 5 probably get used. But it's not where most of, most of the um, snooping um, to use a loaded word, happens these days. Really, the bulk of it is um, storage and disclosure. Um, there's an EC regulation which you don't need to know about because the Home Office will tell you if you do, but basically it's a piece of paper that says you need to store some information. You might keep it anyway. Um, I know, for instance, in, uh, in my case, I keep um, log-on records for when users connected by DSL uh, for a certain period of time, and if you're on 21CN, um, you know where they connected from. Uh, we still believe or not have a few dial-up users. Um, we know where they connected from as well. We keep those records for a period of time, regardless for, for troubleshooting purposes. Um, but the Home Office can come along and say, you're keeping this data anyway. Please, can you keep it for a bit longer? Um, they'll then move on to disclosure um, when they want some data. And you'll get a Section 22 notice, which I am sure quite a lot of you have had. That is where the majority of the, the snooping happens these days. There are half, over half a million of these issued per year. Completely routine. The police have access to them. Um, revenue and customs, all sorts of people, uh, right down to your city council. Um, they can, in fact, issue um, a notice and find out all your uh, email, who you've been talking to on email, if your ISP stores it. Um, in the civil arena, all that's criminal. In the civil arena, you have to get court order. Um, there's no formal process for that other than they go to court. Um, I have added US court orders not valid because I had an argument with someone six months ago where they got a US court order referring to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and handed over a bunch of information. Um, you can't do that either. Um, so that is where we are now. Now, the problem that the security services and I keep saying security services because it is them driving this, are trying to solve is 
that a lot of the data thereafter um, isn't available. They're saying about 25%. So they make half a million requests per year, and over 100,000 of those, for whatever reason, come back um, saying, we can't get this data. Um, they've not actually given us a good breakdown on why. What they're saying is it's to do with data retention. Um, people aren't keeping this data. Um, so that's one of the problems they want to solve is collection of the data in the first place, making sure people are storing it, um, either because the data retention director doesn't get far enough um, or because they weren't generating the data in the first place. Um, to give an example, um, my, I was typing up some notes for this earlier, um, and I'm using the notes application on, uh, on my Mac and transfer it to my iPad. It keeps uploading it into the cloud. Um, now, I'm probably not going to keep, or Apple aren't going to keep every copy of that I type. They can delete the old copies. Um, that's a sort of uh, a thing that you know, wouldn't be covered at the moment. Um, and the security services are interested enough in this data to spend quite a lot of money on it, £1.8 billion over 10 years. Um, interestingly, for those worried about the interception piece, over half of this is going to be on storage. Um, it hasn't been documented very well, but it was said in uh, the bill committee um, that um, they are focusing on storage. I'll, I'll cover that more later. Um, so that's, that's where the bulk of it's going to be spent. Um, beyond that, they're vague about the problem. Um, they, for obvious reasons, can't give specific examples, um, but we're really lacking even in theoretical case studies. So they've defined this problem area. It's quite vague. Um, it, it makes it very hard to suggest alternative approaches for them. Um, there's several names um, this has gone under, um, for those of you who are confused. Um, it started off, uh, for those that are following uh, the political side of things, as the Interception Modernization Program um, in... Um, 2008, someone will probably correct me if I got that wrong, um, under the last government, it was killed due to lack of time. Um, after the election, it became the Communications Capability Development Programme, um, which led, in the Queen's speech, the Communications Data Bill. So when you see lots of different names for this thing, that's why. It's gone under all these names. Um, although it was announced as a bill, it's now draft. Um, so what we're seeing here, as I mentioned, is not the final version. Enough with the politics. This is what the Home Office are actually trying to, to implement. This is what, as far as we can figure out, um, they said they want to do. Um, part one is, is the biggie. This is the interception piece. This is what's got a lot of people really worried. Um, effectively, it says that the Home Secretary, um, in her infinite wisdom... Um, can do whatever the Home Secretary feels like um, when it comes to communications data. Um, again, we're with this vagueness. The security services don't say what they want to do. Um, because of that, they phrased the bill in pretty wide terms. Um, what we do know is that it covers communications data, not content. Now, there's a big argument over... Can you separate data and content? Um, is it feasible? Where do you draw the line? I'm not going to get into that because no one has the answer yet. Um, I, from the point of view of arguing politically about it, we have to assume it's possible um, because trying to argue it's impossible, someone will spend a large sum of money and solve the problem. And then we're left arguing, well, it's impossible on a large scale, and someone will spend even more money and solve the problem. So we have to argue it's difficult, and even that's hard. Um, more interestingly, and this is where it starts having some interesting implications for ISPs, um, it's not going to be, as, as is at the moment, if, if you're in the US in particular, um, you go on to Cisco's website, go to the download side, um, find your box, and download the lawful intercept version of the um, uh, IELTS image you're using, and install it on your router, and, and all's good. The Home Office actually wants to mandate the equipment used. So they'll, they'll go to a vendor, they'll say, please produce the bit of kit that, um, that does this, that uh, does task X, um, and then say to the ISPs, you need to deploy this box that does task X. They're probably not even going to tell us what task X is, because you need to deploy this box. 
with this configuration. Um, and I mean, the idea of us not knowing what goes on inside this box is, is pretty much encompassed by the reply from one guy from, I believe he was home office, I don't know which bit, um, when asked in a meeting about encryption, his reply was simply, it's not a problem. Um, cue lots of uh, worrying about whether they've actually managed to crack SSL or not, but we all know SSL is not strong in the first place. So, again, with the, I think you're getting the impression, the vagueness, particularly on the interception side. Um, the second bit is kind of easier. It, it's storage. This is actually... Really, when you listen to them talking in, in committees and this sort of thing, really what the Home Office are after, um, more storage. They don't particularly want to go snooping on data on the wire because, as we keep telling them, it's quite hard. So we can argue to a blue in the face, breaking on the wire is hard. They're kind of not that interested because they're actually going to go to people like Twitter and Facebook and Apple with iCloud. Um, and get them to store the data at source. No problems about breaking encryption. Um, no problems about having to decode strange protocols. It's simply you generated the data in the first place. You've got to store it. Um, the main difference from Inception Modernization Program, which was through 2010, was simply that the service provider will store it themselves uh, rather than the um, uh, home office having a central database. But... Coming on to disclosure, and I'll cover the button in a second, um, they will still have to serve some sort of notice on the service provider to say, please give us your data. So if you get a section 22 notice now, uh, arriving via whatever mechanism, um, they will do much the same. It won't be section 22, it will be something else. Um, and ask, please can you extract the data from your nice little box that does task X and send it to us. Um, whether the service provider gets any visibility of what's in that data, I don't know, but that will be the system. Um, they can go on fishing expeditions. That's the but from the previous slide. Um, the example given was, we know someone doing something bad was near a mobile phone mast um, at this time. Please send us all the phone calls made anywhere near this mobile phone mast, and we'll filter the data for you. Um, so although... Um, Nominally, it's not a central database. There are elements of it still in the system. Um, the uh, only real main change um, beyond that to the disclosure mechanism is fewer organisations are initially going to have access. So, um, we, as I mentioned earlier, that the uh, local government um, authority, local government associations, sorry, um, are um, concerned that they will no longer have access. Um, probably a good thing. City councils, borough councils, um, won't be able to get the data anymore. But the Home Secretary, as mentioned earlier, pretty much has unlimited power and, and could add that in later. So any wins made now in that regard, simplifying processes, because I know when I've dealt with, with uh, small councils, they were complete pain because they don't have the trained staff and don't understand it. Any benefits we get there could be wiped out quite easily later on. Um, the other interesting... Uh, apologies, I should stop using the word interesting after I speak. Um, is other interest, other point of note <laughs> um, is when you um, listen to the Home Office talking about foreign service providers. Um, I am not a lawyer. I certainly know very little about international law, um, but they think they can get the foreign service providers to cooperate if this bill is in place. Um, Twitter, I, I don't know how big a presence Twitter have in the UK. I don't think I've ever met a Twitter UK employee. I don't know if they exist. Um, but clearly, from the fact Twitter have responded to um, the draft bill and the consultation, they think they could be affected. Um, so, so somehow they believe they can coerce, they can persuade people who might otherwise not be um, interested in, uh, not be covered by UK legislation to, to cooperate. Um, again, that sort of goes back to the theme of they're really not trying to intercept data. They're, they're really trying to get at the data at source. Um, when they talk about service providers, they are um, interested in Facebook, in Twitter, um, in Apple. They're less interested in BT and talk, talk in, in people like that because it will cost them a lot of money. Um, I guess this slide is, is largely a summary of the presentation just now. Um, what the service providers are saying. Um, there's 
some interesting um, discrepancies if you talk to various people involved. Um, the Home Office are saying, don't worry, all the service providers really, really understand what we're trying to do. Um, quick straw poll, hands up in this room, who really think they understand what the Home Office are trying to do? Yeah, for the benefit of the webcasting, no hands went up, and there's, what, 100 people in here? Yeah. Um, the bill committee have spoken to service providers, the technical people, they are less convinced, and people have been uh, talking under oath um, in, when they've been talking to the bill committee. So I, I think no one really understands the impact at this stage. There are some management people and service providers, perhaps, who've talked to, talked to the Home Office um, and gone, yeah, yeah, we can do this if you give us a suitably large amount of money. And no motivation there whatsoever to make profit. Um, but those of us on the ground are less, less certain. Um, I have, in a couple of conversations with, I won't say spooks, high-up civil servants, um, noted a, a tendency to want to get to high-up people, partly for security reasons. Um, they're like people who they can background check. I think it may not be nefarious. It may simply be they're talking to high-up people who they think they can trust. Ooh. Thank you. The hard stuff, um, covering w what I can discern from talking to people, um, from this sort of thing, um, the likely impact. Intersection, for all the discussion about it, um, is actually probably one of the easiest pieces. If you don't have large amounts of international circuits, from what I can tell, and from what other people can tell, they're probably not going to bother. Um, there's no point. Um, if you're buying your transit from a Tier 1 in the UK, they can just go to the Tier 1. There's absolutely no point them going to a small ISP, um, going to uh, people like Adrian at the back, who, for instance, will be a complete pain and probably refuse to cooperate. <laughs> He's, he's nodding. Um, they'll go to the big ones. Um, it's less people to talk to. Um, if, so if you haven't got any international circuit, if you're buying entirely in the UK... Um, they're probably not going to bother. That's how they can get it done for 1.8 billion. Because if you think about the scale of the problem, it's not a lot of money. Um, if you do have international connections, that's when you're going to start having to put something on your network, most likely. Some people will be large enough they're interested anyway. The BTs of this world, the talk talks of this world, those people will have boxes anyway um, that do some form of interception. Um, the difference will be will be on every line rather than some. Um, for those of you that are... Um, uh, aren't aware of how the current system works. Uh, they intercepted Kim.com, mega upload guy. Uh, they intercepted his um, his traffic on his home line, um, and he noticed straight away because of the extra latency and three extra hops. Um, so these boxes do exist. They're automated. It's someone putting in an IP address, and um, uh, and it gets added in. Um, but at the moment, it's, it's not widespread, even for the large providers. Um, for those that do end up putting boxes on, um, as I mentioned earlier, the Home Office are going to mandate the boxes that are put in. Um, the boxes that are built, it's going to be driven by what the Home Office wants, um, not predominantly by um, service providers. So it's going to be the Home Office um, and the customer, in effect. They may never buy a box, but they're going to be the ones saying, we want it to do X. The service providers might go, well, we need this feature set, um, but even though you're the one writing the cheque and then claiming the money back, you don't have the leverage you're going to have over your average vendor. Um, imagine the kind of fun you're going to get reporting bugs um, with that sort of thing. Just thinking off the top of my head, um, this didn't take very long to, to come up with a list of um, potential problems. Anyone that's aware of clean feed in the Wikipedia block knows what happened there. Um, so if they only filter for interesting traffic, if traffic's rooted in interesting policy-based rooted ways, expect breakage there. Um, man in the middle attacks against SSL if they're trying anything clever like that that involves modifying the data stream that has implications um, even if they intercept everything um, we've got technologies like link loss forwarding um, unidirectional link detection which is a, a Cisco specific thing um, I'm afraid I don't know the vendor neutral term for it um, bidirectional forwarding detection we don't know if the box is going to break these things um, so there could be a lot of pain when these boxes first come online um, a lot of learning curve a lot of systems that previously failed over but didn't. Um, the sort of problems that are a real pain to find. Um, and also, operationally longer term, if you want to add another one gig link, 
Um, and this is a problem I believe faced in uh, telcos in more oppressive regimes. Um, you can't just go to your, your boss, uh, whoever holds a checkbook, um, or look at your bank account if you're high up enough in your organisation and go, I need to spend some money on another one gig link. You've suddenly got to go and talk to the home office and go, we need to put another one gig link in. We need more of your boxes. Can we have more boxes, please? So it can really slow things down. It can decrease flexibility um, and deploying things in a hurry if you have obligations that you're not really under control of. Um, storage is slightly easier. Um, there are obviously privacy concerns with storage, but operationally, um, it's simply a vast amount of data. As I mentioned earlier, typing notes on my, on my little Mac earlier, um, it's constantly uploading. Um, they're probably going to want to store every revision because um, if I'm a bad guy, I could store stuff in a note um, and then wipe it once the person I'm talking to has read it. Um, uh, there has been use by, by terrorists, I believe, but it was terrorists in that case, to use the drafts folder on Hotmail to store um, communication. They get all logged in and check the draft folder of this message with the data in. Um, in the Three Lions film, um, terrorists use a, a kid penguin game. I believe it was supposed to be a copy of Club Penguin for those who've got kids of that age um, to chat. So there's a lot of data there, a lot of things you wouldn't normally think of storing that would usually come in one port on a route or one port on a server straight out the other um, that you're going to look at storing. Um, it's a lot of money, but effectively it's just a large data storage um, problem. So as long as you get it right and you're not being asked ridiculous things, I don't think there is too much pain um, on that side of things. If anyone has got any good bits with the pain, well, please grab me off and tell me because it's useful information. Um, finally, and I'll, I'll, I'll speed through this bit, um, on disclosure, um, w this could be an improvement. As I, again, I covered this earlier. Um, it should be much easier to train support staff. Uh, one of the issues I have, one of the issues a lot of people have, is how far down through first line, second line support do you push these sorts of tasks if you can't afford a dedicated team? Um, one would hope if the Home Office are giving us the boxes, they're going to give us a manual for the things, and we can throw the manuals at someone a lot more junior and give them a crash course in Legal 101, um, rather than having to trawl through half a dozen various systems for, for log data, make sure you've covered everything. Um, and get, for state you've stored yourself, um, rather than intercepted, if you built it, one would hope that you built it with the idea of getting the data out in the first place, um, rather than, again, having to trawl through lots of different systems, um, which should make it easier if you build it right in the first place. Um, and with fewer people involved in the single point of contact system and the Home Office having to hand out money, I would hope for an improvement in that. Um, I have been in the painful situation of being at the time a very small service provider and getting Section 22 notices. Validating them is very, very hard because no one will talk to you at the Home Office um, and they don't return phone calls. I ended up saying, no, please get the Home Office to ring me. Unfortunately, I can imagine that a system like this, if you're not in receipt of Home Office money, might make your life more painful. Um, but for the kind of people who are here, getting more medium size to large size, it should make it a lot better. It should be a lot cleaner, certainly than the system was a few years ago. Um, briefly, because this was, this was covered earlier, um, there is a problem for the service providers. Um, the quote I picked out from, from the Twitter submission was legally untenable position. Um, how do you know if someone is in the UK or not? Um, you might end up disclosing data for someone who wasn't in the UK at the time they sent the tweet. Um, if they're travelling between countries, is their user data subject? If they were wanted in the UK five years ago, um, the, there's a lot of grey areas that the people like this are worried about. Again, I'm not an international lawyer. I'm not going to go into detail because, quite frankly, I don't understand it. Um, but there is a lot of worry uh, amongst the large players that this could happen. Um, Direct operational impact in that regard is minimal. Um, it's just you need to know where your users are. Um, for those of you using the wireless in here, um, welcome to, I believe it's the Arab Emirates, um, where Google thinks we are today. Um, that's suddenly gone from being mildly amusing, oh, look, I can't read the page, um, to, whoops, I've just handed over the, your data to the wrong oppressive regime, um, be it the UK or some Middle Eastern country. Um, uh, so it, it could get complicated, um, and I really don't think the Home Office are going to pay for your lawyers to figure it out, for those of you in that position. I think 
you're probably writing your own checks for, for figuring out the legal position. Um, the where to next? Um, as I mentioned, I'm not going to go through the slide in detail. Um, this is a draft bill. This won't happen um, in the current form. And I'll highlight the quote there, actually, um, which was from Julian Huppert at Liberal Democrat Conference, which happened last month. Um, and he said he thought the bill um, was likely to say, and I'm only repeating this because The Guardian printed it, otherwise I, I wouldn't repeat what he said, um, but there were journalists there. Um, you've got the language wrong, you've got the whole concept wrong, you have to start again. Um, he thinks what the bill, the report on the bill will say, um, and he said he thinks that will kill the bill. Um, that's basically um, the general feeling, it is not going to happen. Even if it does, we have something called the Huppert Veto, which is not like Tom Clancy novel, um, but a quote from Nick Clegg basically saying that he will defer to Julian Huppert, uh, and I trust Julian Huppert largely because I'm telling him a lot of things about this, and we've got a lot of people who are telling him. So the danger of this happening now is minimal. It's not going to happen soon. It will happen in a different form. That doesn't mean don't lobby your MP. Uh, don't lobby. If you've got contacts who you can lobby, people in the Home Office you can talk to, it's still worth talking to them because all this has happened before and all this will happen again. We're going to see another version that will probably see um, large portions of this um, and um, will have the same sort of operational impact. Um, thank you. Questions? Do you want to head back up here in case there's any direct to you? Because hopefully there will be. <laughs> I'll let whoever's got the mic choose who's going to ask first. Thank you, Adrian Ball of Net Revolution. Um, you mentioned quite a few um, times at the beginning the, dif the difference between communications data and content. Um, and then you've also given your example of the notes stored in iCloud from your Mac. What is it you'd expect Apple to be storing in that case? The content of the note or that you made it and the timestamp or maybe the size of it? It's not very clear. Um, you won't be able to see because, no. If I store something in notes, um, for those of you who've got an iPad, you know what I mean, you see the top line as kind of a subject line. And it actually stores it on an IMAP server if you're using non, um, non Apple products. I have no idea how Apple store it, whether it's IMAP or something else. Um, that subject line, that first line, is actually basically the content of what you're doing. Um, now, is the subject line of an email comms data or not? Because as far as I'm concerned, it's content. But it becomes comms data when they put it in the subject line of an right, email the of of So the answer TV, is, it? no one, it's a grey line. It's not defined. It will probably be defined by whoever builds the black boxes for, for the Home Office, but whatever surely, Home Office specifies. Surely the service provider would need to push a copy of that data, that piece of data, to the black box. There's going to be some port in the black box that they just send data to and it records whatever gets sent to it. Um, if, if it's done via black boxes, um, rather than... It's not interception, it? So it, it was the interception versus storage argument. Um, it's whether it was intercepted or stored. Um, it's easier if it's stored by Apple and then just go, well, actually, we're going to decree all of this to be content rather than data. Um, if it's intercepted, it's probably going to become comms data rather than content because it happened to appear in the subject line. Right. If it was a Google Docs, say, you could certainly envisage them wanting a record of who accessed the doc mm. when. Right? Yeah, but they wouldn't know what was in the doc. No. Would they want the title of the tab? Yeah, the of the and if you leave it an untitled yeah. one or whatever, that's what people end up doing. Right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, may I ask one more question quickly? Sorry. The, I was really surprised to say that the Home Office don't have direct access to these black boxes and need to go through the service providers. Why are they setting up like that? It's a massive security hole, isn't it, really, for them? Um, that, as far as I'm aware, I, I don't know for sure, is a response to the now dead interception modernization program, which was the response from groups like Node to ID, Big Brother Watch, Open Rights Group, was you are creating a massive centralized database. Because that was the original plan to push all the data to one central point, and the Home Office would run the server farm that stored all the data. Um, I would imagine it's simply a response to that. Thank you very much. Cheers. Adrian. <laughs> 
I've not discussed IPv6 merely because they know enough for IPv4 to get it right, so IPv6 is moot. <laughs> I, I wasn't even going to say IPv6, actually, or even IPv6. Um, the, at the moment, they're talking about trying to get hold of data, and obviously, whatever they do do, even the worst-case scenario, there are a myriad of ways around this um, for end-to-end -end encryption. Now, I assume there's nothing in here trying to outlaw people selling services that off encryption, uh, offer encryption, off-site VPN endpoints, people selling boxes to end users as a service specifically to bypass all this monitoring and promote that as a service, and that won't be illegal to do. As they haven't told us what they're doing, I can only use the quote given by the individual from the Home Office, and I wish I could remember his name, when asked about encryption, which was simply, it's not a problem. I don't know why. Ah, well that, that, we, can use, we can use that quote, because if encryption is not a problem, then he can't possibly suggest that selling such services would be in any way a problem. <laughs> uh, just following up on that, the, the, the logical argument there is, if you're going to create a service that is a VPN endpoint, you just became a service provider, and they'll just serve you with notice to provide the data. You're allowed to ask several questions, by the way. I'm just, also <laughs> doing a great job. I'm just also following up on that. Aren't you just self-selecting yourself to be spied on? So I didn't catch that. If you're building encrypted if you're selling a service um, of encrypted tunnels that you terminate, aren't you then just self-selecting yourself to be investigated more in that argument? On what basis? Nothing you're doing is illegal. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'm not saying it's because it's illegal. You're in Kazakhstan, but you don't care, do you? Sorry, just, just following up. How many people in this room are using a tunnel of some description? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's stupid enough not to on public wireless? Okay, one more question. Any more questions? Looks like we're done. Okay, thank you very much.